Hello, everyone. My name is David Leclerc. I'm the host of the Chalk Podcast, and I'm pleased to introduce what I'm hoping will be a long series of discussions on uh, service and service contracts in the field of flow stometry. I'm going to call this series In the Service of Cytometry because I like James Bond, and I think this is a lovely pun. Uh, what we're aiming here is to explore uh, the situations that I feel most owners of flow stomatry equipment finds themselves, uh, which is essentially we either need to be locked into service contracts that uh, are priced at levels that have no bearing on actual reality of our needs from year after year, or simply try to fix our own instruments on our own. Um, but then we get into the problem of getting access to parts and the knowledge on how to repair our own equipment. I wanted this discussion to start with the voice of uh, Mr. Tony Ledger, who I know through the cytometry uh, uh, listserv hosted by J. Paul Robinson at uh, Purdue. It's a voice that I truly appreciate because Tony is somebody who's uh, very passionate about empowering users and helping them fix their own issues. He really de cares deeply about uh, the right to repair uh, that we should have as owners of flow stomatry equipment. Now, during our discussions, we will name companies, companies that we like, companies that express behavior that we find problematic. Um, there's a couple of things I I'm going to point out here. The first one is the Chalk Podcast is not supported by any company, so we gain nothing by uh, promoting or uh, dissing different uh, groups. And essentially what we're trying to do here is explore our current situation, explore this problem, and hopefully come up with solutions that will be adopted in uh, industry. And with that, I give you Mr. Tony Ledger. Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the Chalk Podcast. My name is David Leclerc. I am the host. I'm here with my co-host today, Bert Ladd. Bert is, I uh, used to be in, the, in my facility at the University of Chicago, is now the leader of all things flow cytometry at uh, Loyola University. He replaced uh, Pat Sims, who's a common features on this uh, uh, on this podcast. Hello, Bert. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you for having me. Coming for everything Pat does. Just trying to <laughs> fill his shoes. And uh, we're extremely excited to have Tony Ledger uh, on as our guest today to discuss uh, service and flow cytometry. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. I I can I ask you something? So, on. Ledger, um, if my my mo is to mispronounce everybody's name, and I know Ledger is a French name, I, <laughs> there's a bunch of people in Quebec with with that last name. Uh, how do you pronounce it? In the states, I pronounce it just like that. Ledger. Okay, Ledger. perfect. Yeah. And and can so we know you through uh, the Purdue list, right? So whenever there's a discussion about uh how you know service on the lsr2s these machines that are getting pulled out of the market by the manufacturers uh people start sending emails asking for help and you're always a voice that's coming in to support people um but but can you explain a bit like how do you got to be in flow stamp tree and uh what's your your experience over the years mm. <laughs> i migrated into flow cytometry from um, military training, actually, as far back as the seventh grade, I started identifying electronics as a field for me. As a marginal student, electronics was one of the things that I could excel at. So it captivated my attention <laughs> based on that. Um, I went to the military. After the military, I worked at Scripps in San Diego. I was a biomed there. I got um, recruited out of Scripps to go into the field by orthodiagnostics. Ooh. Back in the days of the cytofluorograph. And I was working on the clinical side for the hematology analyzers. And that's how I got my bath, I guess, my first lessons in flow cytometry were as a hematology analyzer and a cell counter. Hmm. Then um, BD bought ortho. And it didn't take, <clears throat> I had experience working with BD already as a biomedical engineer working at Scripps. 
So when Ortho sold their servants organization over to BD, um, I was in the company of some of the best field engineers that are in the industry. There was none of us that wanted to make that transition, none of us. And I had already had experience from the outside working with Beckton Dickinson, but it was out of our hands. You know, we were sold down the river <laughs> and that was that. So I understood that my time there was probably going to be limited and it didn't take very long for the mismanagement to just finally catch up and take its toll on me as a person. And so uh, later on, I learned that the average career span for a field engineer in that business is five to seven years, which is the same as an NFL linebacker. <laughs> so that I realized, you know, under the guise that corporate engineers have to run, there's an endless number of calls and an endless stream of them coming at you. The people above you micromanage what you do to the point where if you have something that doesn't go according to schedule, you have a field of dominoes, not a row or a plan. You have a field of dominoes that you have to reset in order to move on to the next part. It's really difficult for people, high caliber professionals, to stay in that arena and keep coming back time and time and time again. When we take a look at some of the original field engineers that created a huge impact in the industry, like Ed Liebhauser and David Poor. These guys were field engineers for 35 years or something like that. The very best in the industry today are still referred to as the best of the industry. But about 10 years ago, when BD's management changed, people like Tom Grondon, Ed Liebhauser, David Poor were complaining because they weren't getting the new hires in. They weren't getting the caliber people that they were in. Within three years, all three of those people had lost their job at BD. So that kind of tells you what happens when you can't meet the standard. You get rid of the standard and you bring in a new lower standard that makes everybody reach it. Right. So that had to change how they did business dramatically. Um, at one point, one of their employees, I'll let them go nameless for now, told me, he said, I'm not very smart. I think I'll be safe <laughs> because they were going through and literally, in his opinion, they were getting rid of the smart people. <laughs> and I asked him, are you worried about, you know, what's going to happen? He's like, no, I'm not very smart. I think I'll be safe. <laughs> and he made it for about another five years. So, <laughs> you know, but then has recently, you know, his time has come as well. So um, it just goes to show what it is. My last trip into Salk. I've been working at Salk since about 2002, helping them out. Um, they have a good program, low budget, pretty standard in my world. So I was down there helping them out and I got to meet their newest, latest BD field engineer. And no disrespect to his profession, but he's from the army and he was formerly a recovery vehicle mechanic. That's a tow truck mechanic for tanks, tow truck for tanks, right. big tow truck mechanic. For the life of me, I cannot possibly see how those skills, which I am familiar with what it takes to do that work. I cannot see how that relates to fixing a flow cytometer. Mm. It's like, you know, I felt bad for the guy and I actually pulled him aside and I let him know that, you know, no disrespect to you, but I'm afraid you're hitting way over your head. He was afraid to use his stream viewing microscope on an LSR2 but he was having a forward scatter problem that he couldn't figure out. How in the mm. heck are you going to figure that out if you don't put a microscope on and look? Yeah. And he was afraid to use it because he thought it was going to hurt his, you know, their safety training was so stringent that he scared the bejesus out of him, I guess. He, he wouldn't use the tools. So, I, you know, I felt bad because we'd already gone into cameras for a decade already by then. So we had gotten away from using those stream viewing scopes except for in a short-term emergency because of, you know, the don't look in the laser beam with that one good eye is an old yeah. saying in our business. <laughs> yeah. So um, at first, back in the days of the fax caliber, the fax scan, you're dealing with 15 milliwatt lasers. 
you know, you can buy laser pointers off the shelf at 7-Eleven, but it'll do 40. Oh, no. <laughs> so a 15 milliwatt's not, you know, I mean, yes, I get the rating and all that. Looking at it through a microscope with a 63X magnification, it just hurts like a flash cube in front of an auditorium where people are putting a lot of flash cubes off. But it's nothing like 100 milliwatts in front of that. So when they started putting these 100 milliwatt, 200 milliwatt lasers on like the LSR2 and these other machines, I'm, you know, I'm really questioning the value of this mm -hmm. because the optic bench is designed for 12. It'll work down to about eight milliwatts. And for the life of me, I can't understand why you need to blast this thing with 10 times more than, you know, five times more is fine. You, you know, but what, what do you need to get to this? At some point, there is a diminishing point of return. And you just start delving yourself into creating other problems that aren't really necessary for the, for the system. And yes. then, you know, as time goes on, we see how they adjust to that. For example, the Celesta, which has the fax scan flow cell and a modernized version of the fluidics and a very nice modernized version of the electronics. And of course, the Celesta is using the coherent stingray lasers, which are fairly low power. Again, after the X20 using super high powered coherent obesis. <laughs> Clearly, they understand that you know, more doesn't necessarily always mean better. Right. But they have to sell against something. And remember, in the very early days of like the Fact Star Plus and the old epics, right? He who had the best laser won, right? If you were a PI and you had the biggest laser, then you were the guy at the top of the pole. <laughs> and now, of course, you know, there's still some of that that's in the market. It's it's not so much, yeah. But we have definitely seen a transition towards not allowing people to have the interaction with the instrumentation that we did long ago when I was first brought into the business. Um, I think half my reputation in the early days came from teaching my clients how to do it themselves because they were in the middle of nowhere. I mean, my territory was the three Western states. So I went from Washington, Oregon, down to Redding, California. And then I went east out to Gillette, Wyoming, and north to the Canadian border. And then at some point, they gave me the three Western provinces in Canada. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Cover half my, of North America. <laughs> yeah, really. My last review, my manager complained how come you're only doing three calls a week? The guys in L.A. are doing five or six. <laughs> <laughs> and what's with this overtime? <laughs> it's like, buy me a jet. I'll be fun. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Just go ahead. So, so so when you left Script, you you started your company or? No, I went no. to work for Ortho. Okay, and okay. I did a stint at Ortho, and then they got bought by BD. Okay. And then I just left. I didn't have any... I had no vision in my mind of being self-employed. I had no vision in my mind of being a third-party provider. This was not something that had even occurred to me. I never gave a single client my home telephone number because I didn't want to be bothered by that. <laughs> Twelve days after I left BD, Dr. Andy Weinberg from Providence Hospital in Portland called me at home. He tracked my home phone number down, and he called me at home, and he, he wanted help with his fax scan. I told him I don't work for that company anymore. And he told me that he understood that. And that's why he called me on my home phone. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't matter. You know, can you come and help me? And so I, you know, took the step to go and help him. And, you know, I did exactly what I always had done for five years previous. And, you know, I slid the service report across the table and explain to him what the charges were. And, you know, three weeks later, I got the paycheck from Providence and it was about what I made in three weeks working at BD. Wow. And I did this in a day and then the light went off and the bell went off and I said, Oh, 
<laughs> cut out the middleman. Let's right. get rid of the middleman. Let's just go right after the PIs. Let's go talk to the guys who got the boxes. Let's don't talk to the guys who want to play God. And that's how it started. And it, you know, it took 10 years or so to gather up enough momentum mm-hmm. to get going. At the time, there was no Purdue list or the ability to reach out to other people who had a flow cytometer. <laughs> it was the guy you knew talking to the guy you knew. Right. Talking to the guy you didn't know. And so that's how the whole business got started. It, I think that's probably one of the reasons why I've been able to remain fairly stable because I've always had that word of mouth thing. I, I never really advertised the couple of ISAC shows that I did, you know, for better or worse, it was good networking. Definitely. I don't think I would really use it as a marketing program in the future though. Do you still do them or not so much anymore? I, I don't, I don't do them so much anymore. I, I mean, I like doing it and everything, but it's, as I explained earlier, it's like that giant game of whack-a-mole, right? Too much visibility makes my life crazy. I can't hire and train people fast enough if I go out and create the visibility. Yep. Because like what we see happening with the LSR2 now, you know, they just did that with ARIAs. They just did that with fax calibers. They finally have backed off of even working on fax scans. And there's more stuff just coming around the corner. They've brought the fax verse alive and killed it going on three times, I think now. (laughs) And they're not the only ones involved in this. In fact, BD is the last player to the game when it comes to this kind of behavior. The reason why I've always just specialized on BD equipment and not branched out to everybody else's brand is because BD was always the most compliant with federal law about providing parts. Mm -hmm. And that's the the fact that they owned the majority of the market at the time was like, you know, it made it real easy to draw a circle around that and put an arrow. Let's go here. When I got into the market, as we learned with, you know, as I learned with the story from Andy Weinberg was there were so many people who were underserved by the manufacturer that I didn't have to step on anyone's toes to get business. So I didn't have to come in and go, okay, you BD guys, you're out of here. It's my turn. They were, they weren't anywhere around. All I had to do was show up and I win because yeah. nobody else would even bother to show up. And so when you're dealing with a marketplace that is that underserved, you can pretty much write your own ticket. Right. And so that's, you know, for better or worse, that's where I've been for the last 30 years is involved in trying to figure out how to make a good life out of this. And now I'm sitting here looking at, oh, I've done very nicely with that. Who do I pass it on to? <laughs> I have a really nice situation here. How do I pass that on to somebody else who is, you know, who cares about this situation and is willing to work and go for it? My thing, <clears throat> I'll be real clear about this. It started out as that one guy calling me up, asking me for help, begging me not to make him go to those other people. So I've never really changed that orientation. I'm still out there looking for the people who need help. I'm not out there looking for the people that have budget money to dump. They're they're really not, they're not my customers. Those are for the manufacturer. Right. My customers need help. They need to get by. It just works an awful lot better for both of us in that regard. I don't feel you know, I feel good about the work I do. I feel great about helping people out. It's nice that I can take a paycheck home and do that. The good part is, is I get to look at myself in the mirror tomorrow morning. <laughs> you know, I don't feel sheepish. As a as a field engineer, you wake up and you look at yourself in the mirror and it was all you could do to keep your eyes open. You were just so burned out that you didn't have an opportunity to really have a life. Yeah, yeah. So, it sounds like you... I was just gonna say, it sounds like you don't see, it sounds like you don't foresee this situation getting better from the manufacturers. Uh, so. Oh, heavens no. No, No, they're going to the, they're going to the realm of Biorad. So when I first started at Scripps, um, out of the, after I got out of the Navy, I'd done a couple of uh, stints as a manufacturing technician. And then I got hired on as a biomed at Scripps. The guy that trained me in there, 
explained to me how difficult it was to work with BioRad. This is like 38 years ago. <laughs> they haven't changed one bit. They are the most difficult company to get anything from. A typical retort or reply from a request for help or service from a BioRad rep goes something akin to this. It's probably worn out, you should just buy a new one. Yeah. The last time I heard that was at my good client, Providence Hospital. They're in the middle of a six year study and need to not change cytometers in the last year of the study. <laughs> and uh, their BioRad, BioPlex 100 was giving them sampling problems. And they got the word that it was probably worn out and I should come over and have a look at it because they can't really afford to do this. But BioRad was not interested in giving them any technical support. They were not interested in giving them service. And I went down there and one of the air resistors for the pneumatic powered sampling system was leaking. This is the same air resistor used in most of the BD instruments that's known for leaking. <laughs> and so when I took the lid off of the BioPlex 100, I've never seen one before, but I immediately identified that component <laughs> and took some soapy water to it and of course found it was leaking. And I pulled one out of my bag and stuck it on and turned it on and that was their worn out instrument, an 18, 20 cent plastic oh. part. Yeah. That is notorious for leaking. It's, you know, we carry them in our bag. We check them every PM on every instrument that has them because we know that this is a part that's not manufactured right. It's manufactured okay, but it's not. It's never meant to be used in the situation that BD is using it at. It's meant to be used in a situation where it has so much overhead that it could leak out all orifices and it would still work. And that's not how it is with the BD machines. They have barely enough airflow to make them work. So when you have a little leak, it causes sampling problems. Ironically, in our research, we found that there are three other components that are built that their manufacturing does not make them prone to this type of a leak. <laughs> Incidentally, one of those pieces is almost identical to the part that they use in the fax scan to do the same job, which of course never leaked. <laughs> so that was a point where we saw engineers move from a very stoic uh, design over to components that were prone to failure. And we've seen that happen on several different instrument lines besides BD stuff. So we don't know if it's just, you know, inexperience on the part of the, of the design engineer coming in and maybe just doesn't know that component's a piece of crap, or if it's their protocols telling them to not make these instruments last for 12 or 15 years, but only make them last for two or three years until they need service. So I definitely see something's going on. I'm not inside. I'm in my own little microcosm, so I have to speculate as to why they're doing that. Their whole entire business is governed by shareholders. Right. Right? So the value of their stock is what's really going to govern the bottom line and all decisions that are made from the top to the bottom. So we have to understand that our budgets are, you know, have they have a target on them, that they're out after our money, however they want to do it. And... Sometimes I think that the way they approach it is counterproductive, and I'll explain that. <laughs> In my particular situation, 15 years ago when BD was open for business, Steve Zaganti was in charge. I had access to field engineers that I could discuss things with freely. I could call their order processing and get any part put on my desk or in one of my clients if they had an account with BD by tomorrow morning. I used to laugh that I got better support from them as a third party than I did when I worked there as an engineer. 
that's how good it was. It was it was a fine situation. Nobody had any problem. The Western District Field Service manager told me, we don't care if you're there because we really make our money on reagent. We don't really make our money on service. That's about a 25 percent margin. Reagents are in the thousand. So as long as you keep boxes sucking juice, we're happy with that. <laughs> yeah. At that point in time, I had two other individuals working with me. We were running through somewhere in the neighborhood of 125000 a year in parts that we were buying from BD. SciTech came, Big March went on, BD management changed. Here we are today. Last year, I think we spent $5,200 at BD. But my service revenue was more than it was 15 years ago. They're just not getting that 125 k anymore. I've gone someplace else to find those parts. I've found different avenues to acquire those support pieces that we once bought from them just without even thinking. We just went straight to them and got it. We knew it was going to be high priced. We knew, but it was so much easier to just buy the one you needed. You don't have to do any engineering to make it fit. There's no conversion process. You just bolt it in. But they sort of shot themselves in the foot. The part do you that think... they forgot is the part that I was taught way back in my early days. And that is that if there is a BD cytometer on the counter, there's BD reagents in the refrigerator. And so you want to keep that BD cytometer on the counter as long as you possibly can, because the refrigerator is where we're making our money. And they've completely gotten away from that. Now, for some reason, they feel like they can do things like this LSR2 push out. They understand that it's going to push people into the marketplace, but they foolishly believe it's going to push people into their market. And right. that's just simply not true when you have companies like Stratadyme out there who are offering a better product, better service, better support, all the way around a better function. You're just going to see, you know, BD's market share continue to erode. 20 years ago, they had 80, 85 percent of the market share. Now, they're 45 percent of the market share because it's, it's been sliced up fill, yeah. in, in amongst so many of these other um, companies. And, you know, I talk about Stratodyme a lot. The reason why I talk about these guys a lot is because, A, I'm impressed with them. The guy that designed that is the same guy who designed the Canto 1, which is still a very much a mainstream instrument for BD. They told him it was a stopgap to get them over to the fax verse. <laughs> And now the fax verse has, you know, come and gone so many times. It's a bad song. <laughs> and the Canto 1 has been re relaunched as the new Canto. So it's a Canto. The new Generation 3 Canto is a Canto 1 with dancing lights, like the Canto 2 has. Yeah. But inside it is absolutely a Canto 1. The only main difference is a fluidic manifold instead of discrete valves. The first Canto 3 we saw come out actually even came out on a Windows 7 Diva 8 platform. So <laughs> they didn't do much. So his engineering is good and solid because he took the fax scan and turned it into an automated machine that's quite well prepped for the next generation of cytometers. But as most people who are really good and they work at BD... They find that at some point they need to move along. Too smart. And I think it's too smart. Yeah, I, I just think it's a culture there. I, I really don't know how else to explain it. But um, he moved along to design his own instrument and work with his own crew. And I think they've been in business now for 13 or 14 years. I've never seen one of these instruments made by Stratodyme up for sale on the used market. I've never seen one at auction. I've never had anybody call me and ask me, can you fix this for me? It's the only cytometer that I've never seen available for sale in an auction someplace. It's the only one no one's ever called me and said, can you fix it? And so I look at that brand. It's like, well, 
either this thing is stupid reliable or their service is phenomenal. Either way, if I'm going to put a big pile of my money on the table, I'm going to go over there because every client I talk to about these people have nothing but good things to say about them. It's not like what we run into now. They're the group who said you buy an instrument and it will never go obsolete, right? Correct. Right. That's correct. Now, to I, I can go one step further. That's a great, that's a big boast. You know, yeah. that's a big boast for a manufacturer. But I was just recently down at Shervin's plan. He had me down there giving me a tour. And he showed me an instrument that he's brought in from one of his first customers out in Houston. This instrument's 12 years old. And he's going through and he's refurbishing the entire flow cytometer for them at no charge. Whoa. Because the, the metrics that they collect was saying that it was starting to, you know, get a little looser than it should. That's wow. amazing. Do so they... rather than wait for this thing to start having maintenance problems, he has a different approach. Does Stratodyne make like parts available easily to customers or even third-party people? I've never even heard of anybody needing one. Oh, fair point. <laughs> what they do is so, they don't even have a field service department. Uh, if wow. you should have something go wrong with your Stratodyne, they'll send one of the engineers from the factory out to fix it. Oh, wow. They don't even have any issues like that. So when you take a look at the sheer volume of metrics that they collect off of the instrument itself, it's amazing. They, <laughs> they get so much data off of there. And, you know, anytime you want to send them the data, you just click the button and they can look at your data. If you think it's not working right, you can send all the metrics up. They can take a look at it and tell you exactly what's going on with it, which is to me, which is huge. It's phenomenal. Yeah. They're their sampling robot is also just an amazing piece of equipment. And the software to operate the sampling robot, it's built into their regular acquisition analysis software. It's not a standalone rider piece that's off in some other land. So when you have an update of the operating system or an update of this package, it doesn't create a ripple effect. Like when you, if you look at the Guava systems or the Attune systems, they're all married in with somebody else's robots and that translation software isn't well supported and the people that write the translation software often don't have full access to the packages that they have to interface with on either end so first of all they're paid to just write the translator rarely do the large companies come back and pay them for updates so they're not very forthcoming with the updates to start with. And I've run into multiple problems with people having issues like this. And, you know, Stratodyme solves that by putting their operating software for their robot right in. It's not just a sampler. It's actually a prep robot. So oh, for good. kinetic testing hmm. and these kinds of things, you can actually set it up with the items that you need to go. And it'll do the sampling. It'll do the pipetting everything for you, which is amazing when you're dealing with the kinetic measurement because the human error of pipetting and messing with a timer, you know, robots can just eat you alive <laughs> with their consistency. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask you and about so, uh, the, uh, so back to, you, you were saying this cost of service has gone up, like the parts have gone more expensive and so on. And sure. I was also thinking about service contract and I kind of see service and service contract as two different parts of most manufacturers company that works uh -huh. against each other. Be, uh -huh. But in this particular case, they're both punching us some yeah. in some different ways. Yes. So the, the manufacturers encourage you to have a service contract by charging exorbitant prices for their time and material service. Um, the first company that I saw do this was Beckman Coulter. And um, I think it was maybe on the Galios or possibly the MoFlo. I don't remember, mm. but it was about in that generation somewhere where they were just giving an estimate of 15,000. So if you called and wanted service, they just wanted a PO for 15,000. I understand that um, now it's 8,500. But I also understand that the companies like um, 
like BD are doing the same thing, but they're doing it slightly differently. Um, as we saw with Melissa's um, quote that she recently posted on the Purdue list, where they put in uh, a huge amount of money for parts, travel, and labor. They put like $4,000 for parts, travel, and labor. And they're probably not going to charge you for that. But they put it on the estimate so they don't have to come back to you and say, hey, we're going to need an extra four grand. Right. They put that up front so their guy can just go and work unfettered. That way, he doesn't have to worry about the ring around the rosy situation. He can just go there, do what he wants. He can drop the bill. It's paid. Boom, down the road they go. Nobody has to fight. And so that's the reason why they're doing that. But a lot of people don't understand that they might not charge you for that. But they can if they want to. <laughs> right. And so you have to be really, really careful about how that is. If you have a good field engineer and you have a good rapport with that good with that field engineer, then chances are you're not going to see a bill that's going to come anywhere close to what that estimate was. However, if you have a new guy who doesn't know anything about the game, he's just going to dump the whole thing. That's what the PO is for. Here's what you get. <laughs> right. And they're not really at liberty. They turn in the service report. The service report gets closed out. And then billing picks up that, and they put that against the PO. Mm -hmm. So if it comes in with very little information, they're just going to bill the whole thing because they can't sort out. They don't know what's wrong. You know, <laughs> They have a PO for $8,200, but this guy looks like he only did a half an hour's worth of work. Uh, okay, let's just bill that. <laughs> yeah, yeah because there's the service report wasn't you know wasn't done right um there is a huge push towards what we call in in our business we call it the ferengi approach <laughs> where oh, it's just get their money now and then you know give them credit later <laughs> and so we see that kind of um you know prospect going forward and we're trying to figure out how to mitigate, you know, what we're doing, like with the LSR things, we're trying to set up a subscription program where we can bring our users and the people who have them into a group where we can provide a shared resource where they have access to the service manuals, parts lists, basic maintenance procedures, all the things they would need to do it themselves, plus have access to the remote viewing stuff that we've got and access to an engineer straight away not call and then have him, you know, call you back, but actually call him and have him answer his cell phone, that kind of straight away. So you can get answers to questions that you need quick. In my career, I've been able to knock out about 85% of the service calls that come into our call center over the telephone. So having the person on the other end subscribed and trained properly is really huge. It's really huge. It makes oh, yeah. a big difference for us. It makes a big difference for, you know, for the users. So our clients can manage to get by without having a service contract, because if that year comes and they do have to have a service call in between their PMs, they know that it's not going to be the death of them because the rest of the machine's in good order. You are yes. going to have that opportunity for stuff to just fail out of the blue, but you know, we try to do our best to head that off at the pass. Our maintenance program is based on what we've seen fail, not the three-point ignorance that is listed in the service manual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think that's a, a good spot to to uh, shift a bit our discussion. So, so okay. we discussed like how service changed over the years. And I kind of wanted to switch to how to help owners of instruments. And I think I have a, a story for you just to tell you how mad people are in the field about this situation. Uh, myself, uh, Bert and myself, we're both part of this uh, core manager meeting organized by the Canadian oh. Cytometry Microscopy Association okay. uh, back in uh, February in Ottawa. It was called the Cold Summit. Okay. That's cool. Hey, um, <laughs> Bert organized this uh, this workshop on uh, maintenance on the instrument, right? And and this deemed such a hot topic that he was asked to 
run it twice back to back in the same afternoon. Okay. First session, he uses slides, you know, drives the discussion, asks questions, what kind of uh, tools you have in your uh, box, uh, what kind of uh, reagents do you use to clean the instrument and mm. like all by the book, slide by slide, it goes through his deck of slides and everything works properly. We, we had uh, service engineers from different companies that were sponsoring the meeting uh, in the audience. So they would interact and answer questions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. First sessions, beautiful. Everything works great. Second session, Bertz decides, I'm just going to wing it. I'm going to not use my slide. And immediately, immediately, the people, the audience just like turn on the service engineers and just like, why is it we can't fix our instrument? Why can't we do this? And blah, blah, blah. And we just like 15 minutes of just like beautiful chaos. And, and that, it was awesome. It was a much more exciting <laughs> session for sure. <laughs> that's uh, that's always, it's fun to see people get enthused by that. One of the things that we ran into, there's there is really a dichotomy in the marketplace though. And it gets back to the magic juice, magic box thing. Um, what I noticed, uh, I guess it was about 2010 at the ISAC show was when I really picked up on the trend. Um, I'd kind of gotten some suspicion and I'd seen some of the marketing and it sort of seemed like, boy, they're taking the knowledge right out of that. But then later I saw this kind of pick up as a trend and later you know, coined a phrase for it. But around 2010, I saw an expansion in the type of companies that were doing flow cytometry work. And I saw it come out of the research realm and go into the manufacturing realm or into the biotech realm. A lot, you know, I saw a lot more of that than I had seen before. And so in the research realm, it's it's the land of PhDs. You pretty much had to have a PhD or working towards a PhD to even get a flow cytometer or be involved in them. You had to have at least a high level knowledge of biology to even get in the lab. So you pretty much understood who your marketplace was be. When we got over to the production side of people, they're pulling people out of the temp agency to operate their cantos and to operate their fax calibers. And so their demand to the manufacturer was to make devices and to make products that didn't require that biology degree and that didn't require a high level of training to operate. They didn't want an instrument that required a 45 minute training class to operate correctly. They wanted magic juice, magic box. And so I saw this trend going towards this as we saw this demand for sales to come into the production realm. And the production realm was bringing it into their world. They weren't going into the world of flow cytometry. They were bringing flow cytometry into the world of production. And that really hadn't happened. And so that's where I think the, the real drive for magic juice, magic box came along. From the manufacturer's standpoint, you got to take a look at this from a realistic situation. The tighter and the closer they can hold all of their secrets about that box, the more revenue that they feel like they're going to be in charge of. As I've shown, they might not really be able to command it, but they're in charge of it. And that's something that as they go further and further down the road, they realize that as the marketplace gets diversified, they need to stake their territory and have control of those things that are ultimately just theirs. We laugh about, uh, about stuff. Now I talk with some of my old friends that worked, that I worked with back in the days of ortho. And we laugh that by today's standards, half of our lunch meetings would have been, um, treasonous meetings in, you know, intellectual property, because there was so much information that was so freely shared from one group to the next, that now you would be fired if you were an employee and have those conversations with your customers, because you'd be giving away the shop. So that has changed. 
a lot. And as the market has diversified this goal towards magic juice, magic box, maybe it's better that we don't let them know what we're doing. Maybe it's better that we don't let them know how that works. And that way there won't be these other smart people who come up and try to knock that product off. And so, you know, as third party service started to encroach on BD and on their service revenue, I can't help but feel they maybe felt a little pressed to, you know, jump into that arena with everyone else instead of remaining sort of, you know, the beacon in the industry or um, the standard of the industry that says you can comply with federal law and still make money. That you don't right. have to shut people out. You don't have to act that way. And, you know, in case, in fact, in some cases, it it's counterproductive to act that way because people will go somewhere else knowing that you're just going to dump them down the river in five years or something like that. So it's interesting. You mentioned to, kind of seeing this all start happening. You said like 2010 ISAC was when you kind of first caught that trend. I was looking earlier, first. right. I was looking earlier today, just like the share prices of some of the big manufacturers like BD, Agilent, Biorad. And it's like right around then to 2013, you start to see it just skyrocket. <laughs> and I just wonder if like it's it made me think of like Amazon Prime. They love right. because just at the beginning of every year, they just get this huge influx of subscription money. And I have to right. wonder if it's a very similar thing for service contracts. It's just a very reliable way to make shareholders happy. Yes, yes. Well, there's a number of different ways that they try to do it. You know, um, companies are all different with their service contracts and how they put them together, how they market them out. Most of the ones that I see nowadays are trying to incentivize long-term contracts. So if you sell, if, if you buy or a three or a five-year contract, they'll give you an incentive like we're not going to raise the rates or we'll give you a 10% discount or something like that. We've always tried to, you know, be as fair as we can with the service contracts, but, you know, we definitely recognize that it's kind of an insurance program that, you know, you're really letting somebody else mitigate your risk for you <laughs> and you're doing so quite willingly. And in the old days where the field engineers took time to share with the users how to do basic maintenance and how to keep up the little jobs after themselves. That was an okay thing. You know, contracts were really, you know, quite a good deal for both sides of the fence. In the days of Magic Juice, Magic Box, you have the client who doesn't prep their sample. They clog the cytometer. They call you, oh, it's broke. Come fix it. I can't see my cells. And we go running out there and, you know, after a half an hour of checking and finding everything is okay, we put a syringe on the, on the sip and pull the plug out of the bottom of it and go, oh, that was it? <laughs> That's it? <laughs> it would have been way easier just to tell them, you know, reach in the drawer, you have a tool. Right. Just grab that tool, stick it over there, pull back on the barrel of the syringe. See, there you go. Again, our maintenance and our tools and our procedures are based on what really happens to stuff not something that an engineer wrote down on a piece of paper thinking that's how it's going to work. And one of the main problems that we've seen with uh, instruments, like, first of all, let me, let me <laughs> stop for a second and digress if I could. The number one complaint for problems on flow cytometers across the board, no matter what brand, it's always the same complaint. I can't see my cells. That's it. So we like to laugh because every flow cytometer, there's a whole bunch of things that can make it so you can't see your cells, mm -hmm. <laughs> up to and including not having any in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> so when somebody comes out with a, you know, complaint, I can't see my cells, that's a wide open canvas for the painters in our club. <laughs> you know, you can really go a long ways from there. So it's, you have to take some time and try to parse out you know, what is it that you're actually having that makes it so you can't see your cells? And, um, you know, we found when we would do failure analysis on a lot of the problems where the SIP, the introduction probe, was clogged, we never had a one of those that had a clog 
above 10 millimeters from the bottom of the probe. So every single one of those things was clogging right down at the very bottom of it. So we were wondering why in the world a company like BD would give you a wire to ram that even further oh, yeah. up in there. But this, why are you trying to push it through a wire that, or through a tube that's four inches long or something like that? And so we developed the understanding that, you know, if the back flush and the dripping on the older systems don't do it, then just put a syringe on there and put a vacuum on it and pop the plug out the bottom. That's what we teach our people. We give them like a 50 cc syringe, a blunt needle and a piece of DCM tubing, show them how to take the outer sleeve off for the LSR and that genre and show them how to use a bigger tubing for the cantos. But the fix is the same. You just, you know, suck the plug back out the bottom. Don't try to stuff it through the top. Um, so there's one of those kinds of things where the factory procedure would get you into trouble. The factory procedure would have a tendency to get you into trouble because it doesn't really accommodate the whole reason how you got to that moment to start with. Um, now, my guy that was just recently um, finished his very long tenure with BD was a um, it was he was a field engineer for many years, seven or eight years. He and I were were in the Navy together prior to that. When I was working at BD, I got him hired in. We were field engineers together. He was in L.A. Then he moved uh, to take a job in tech support after he was pretty much burned out from being in L.A. and being a field engineer. Um, he took technical support and he's been working in tech support for a really long time. And during the last management change, his job went from general flow cytometry tech support helper to the guy who fills in the blocks on the screen. He had 15 minutes. So if you call BD right now and you ask for help, the timer starts on you. 15 minutes from now, if that tech rep doesn't have you squared away and something hasn't been done, his manager will chime in to him telling him to kill it or dispatch it. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. 15 minutes or, or tech support, like send, send an engineer over. Right. You got 15 minutes. If you can't resolve the problem in 15 minutes, you have to dispatch it. So you think about that in the terms of where we're at, we know for a fact that we rarely ever even get to the crux of the matter in 15 minutes. We're still talking about the symptoms, trying to yeah. figure out how you got that way. So for us, it seemed like a very unreasonable um, set of parameters or set of protocols to place on their technical support people. It's like, here are some of the greatest trained people in the industry, and we're not going to let them talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> what? So what can be done then for, cause it seems then that the solution would be for the owners of the instrument to be better informed, to be able to yeah. identify issues themselves, troubleshoot mm -hmm. to a degree that you can explain in precise details what's going on. Where do you get that kind of training? Um, well, the vocabulary is long lost. If you go back to like the fax scan user's manual, and you compare that to the fax canto 2 user's manual you'll notice that there's a dramatic difference in vocabulary the vocabulary hasn't changed in flow cytometry it's gotten bigger but the canto 2's user's manual doesn't really explain any of the vocabulary very well at all mm -hmm. they kind of expect you already to figure that out where you know back in the old days everybody got that training um you know, i've done lots of operator training classes i used to use operator training classes as a form of marketing because what I learned was the students that I taught at company X moved on to company Y. And when they got to company Y and they were underserved by the manufacturer, they remembered that guy that taught them back at company X. Yep. And so when they moved along to another company, chances are I moved along with them. And that was a perfect way to have a qualified client because I've already trained this person. Yeah. We already understand each other, and yeah. you know, we have a rapport built up before then, so I won't hear any of this, oh, it's broke, come fix it. You know, it's like, let's find out why it's broke, because we can probably fix it right here instead of having to send somebody out. But if we do, 
you know, that's what we do, but that's not all we do. <laughs> and we do have the ability to help you sitting right here. And we're building advanced tools to try to take that up to another level, to bring it up to where we're at. Um, honestly, my biggest drawbacks now is I've seen so many of the other things that I've developed over the decades get pirated by large companies and turn into products because I didn't have the, you know, the intellectual property locked down mm. real tight. And so that's one of the things that I'm most concerned about, like with this remote viewing thing is, is I'm scared that, you know, BD is going to see that and realize that this fits on every cytometer they make. And, uh, you know, right. now I'm, you know, I'm out of my own product again. And I've already had this happen twice. So, right. so I, I'm, I'm not like it could happen. <laughs> it's like, it does. <laughs> and there are companies out there that are unforgiving about that. And I'll name them if you want. <laughs> I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but well, I mean, I guess for me, it is because I've always been that person who will call them out when I hear nonsense being published over the Purdue list about some inappropriate direction that a manufacturer is trying to take towards a client. That annoys me because we have a federal laws and we have fair trade practices that are in effect. And nobody has given any of these companies the ability to opt out just because they're this or that. Under the latest um, movement of right to repair, back when the you know respirators and things were, you know, the right to repair movement got a big shot in the arm over that. Um, Medical companies were trying to get exceptions. They were trying to be opted out of compliance. And, and they're currently not. So here they were trying to use that as an advantage to create a shelter for themselves by using the public sentiment. Fortunately, the public sentiment said, no, no. That, no. we don't believe you. It, can <laughs> you underline were... what that means exactly? What what are would be the, our rights uh, under these, these provisions of right to repair and so on. If they, you mean if the medical device manufacturers were allowed to opt out? No, that they are not allowed. What does that mean if, for us? Well, if, if they're not allowed to opt out, then absolutely nothing would change. We would still mm -hmm. have the protections that we currently enjoy. Okay, which are essentially, we should have a right to purchase parts. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. According to the case that was settled um, uh, by uh, under Kodak, V, I think it's ISP, is the is the case. Mm -hmm. Independent service providers. Anyway, so there was a lawsuit long ago about Kodak against Kodak with a, when a bunch of independent service providers went back to them for egregious practices that they were doing, which are very similar to what we see happening out here in the industry now. And the result of the case basically boiled down to this: Kodak was ordered, and all as a federal precedent, was ordered that if you make a part available to your field engineers, you have to make it available to a third party. You can't overcharge the third party for it. It has to be made available at a reasonable price. That reasonable price is set by the manufacturer, but it can't be egregious. That's where the gray area comes in. What is egregious pricing? All right, let's take, for example, Let's take a violet laser replacement in a Canto II. This is a fairly standard instrument, fairly commonly used. The violet laser that it takes to replace in any Canto, I can buy what I consider to be the best replacement from Vortran. It's going to cost me somewhere under $8,000. If I go to BD and I want to buy their version of that same laser, it's $32,000. They won't sell me the laser. They'll sell me the assembly, which is the laser, the heat sink, the power supply, the control board, the fiber, and the holder for the fiber mm. for $32,000. Though they're only selling me about $12,000 worth of stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah. At, at a retail market, even at BD's price. But they won't sell it individually. They sell it all as assembly. 
So if I call them and I say, I need a Kineflex cable for my violet laser, well, we have a violet replacement assembly, $32,000. Right, okay. <laughs> Instead of $1,400 if I go to DigiKey and just buy the cable from DigiKey. So this is how they work their stuff. They know they own the parts. The court case, Kodak VISP, determined that the manufacturer does in fact own the parts. And that because the manufacturer owns the parts, they own control of the secondary repair marketplace, even though they claim they do not. The, the court clearly found that, you know, that was a false claim, that they, in fact, do have control of that marketplace based on, on that. They also have a heavy influence on the secondary resale market based on whether or not they still support a piece of equipment. And so if they have a piece of equipment and it's still in their support roster, they're supposed to make spare parts available to anyone just as if they were a field engineer. But this rarely ever happens. Mm -hmm. How we've seen BD mitigate this is they've stopped allowing their field engineers to do component level replacements. And instead, they're making their field engineers do assembly level replacements. And that way they don't have to make the parts available to SciTech or me or anybody else. Right. Now they have a giant fear of me based on their experience with SciTech. I can't get them to the table to talk with me, to let them understand that I, you don't need to be afraid of me. I'm, I'm your helper. I am not your nemesis. I'm the person who will go in and clean up the stuff you guys leave behind. That's what I do. Are you familiar with the children's story, Charlotte's Web? I am mm -hmm. not. Bert, Bert, you are. I am. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm Templeton the Rat. I live underneath okay. the slop tray, and I come out of my hole, and I pick up whatever the pigs slop over the edge, and I go right back to my place, and I enjoy it very nicely. I live on that. I don't care what the pigs are up to. They can go and just make as big a mess in that tray as they want. They can make a mess out of the arena. I'm on cleanup duty. That's where I make my living is cleaning up the stuff that they slop out. And I don't mind a bit. I'm happy with that. That keeps me in a place. Like I said, I'm, I'm a little guppy in a, in a tank full of sharks and I don't really want to get eaten. So, but now they want you to buy the whole trough. <laughs> of course you well, can. Well, they try. You know. <laughs> but it's gone it's gone south on them because what I did was I went out and I just got instruments off of the used market and I built my own parts bank mm -hmm. and I have you know I've expanded my shop 10 years ago I didn't do anything in my shop I worked on my car in my shop worked on my motorcycles my snowmobiles I did my boats I didn't have no flow cytometers in here now the whole building from one end to the other is flow cytometers and so we bring them in and we take them down and we figure out how they work. If I don't have service manuals, I'll go out and I'll shake the network down and I'll see if I can find one laying around in the dirt someplace. And if not, I, I don't really care. I'm, I'm a Navy trained electronics technician and they made it very clear to us, you, you know, like week five of training that when the bullets are flying and the bombs are going off, you ain't going to read this shit anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's better if you just know how to do it <clears throat> and so i always kind of develop my techniques and my skills based around the fact that i don't really have access to that and chances are i'm probably not going to read it when the chips are down anyway so it's better to just understand it well enough to be able to think it through and figure it out so um i, I regrettably didn't start working with the cyan product line until three or four years ago that was a mistake i should have been 10 years ago i should have been working with that product line turns out it's a pretty darn well designed piece of equipment oh, you when like it? you yeah the cyan when you go in and you remove some of the components that the manufacturer put in that i recognize as not being very stoic components and you replace those with components from a different manufacturer now the cyan becomes a box that'll run four or five years without a service call. Mm -hmm. Which is great. Every one of the cyans that we saw come in for recycling had 
one or more of the vacuum or pressure sensors bypassed by a field engineer. Every huh. single one of them. Wow. They didn't even bother to replace them because they were so sketchy. They just bypassed it. And, you know, don't need that sensor anymore. It'll work fine without it. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of handy to have it, though. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a point at which, like, these uh, parts you can get from recycling instruments start to kind of dry up, especially when they're not available from the manufacturer anymore? Like, if they don't support that platform anymore? I don't really know. I mean, I would imagine there are going to be some instruments that will see that. Mm -hmm. But I know for sure we won't see that with the fax calibers because there are just so many of them out there. There's 10,000 or more of those in existence. We won't see it with the LSR2s. Again, there's 10,000 of those things in existence. The parts that are used in the LSR2 are used in the Fortessa are used in the X-20 to a high degree. So there's a number of forward instruments that are still in production that still have equivalent parts to doing that. Now, how BD cycles these things out the tailpipe and how they've historically done this was at some point along the game, the fax caliber, they stopped giving installation criteria for anything but a fax caliber. So, for example, fax station version 5.2.1, you could connect a fax scan, a fax sort, a fax caliber, an LSR, a Vantage, basically anything they'd made up to that point. Fast forward a couple of revs, at fax station 6.0, you could connect a fax caliber, <laughs> period. Mm -hmm. mm. And that was that. <laughs> if you had a fax scan, you were telling the software it was a fax caliber in order That's to get it to install. <laughs> I've I've noticed that in in the last few years in my institution, a lot of really old instruments are not dying because of like broken lasers or like complete instrument fail. It's all computer. The yes. computer craps out, and there's no way to replace it, so you can't run your instrument for whatever yes. reason. Like it's. Software obsolescence is mm -hmm. a very real thing, and it's, it, it was embraced by the manufacturers coming in. They, they really want it. Um, I've got a, a gentleman working with me who is an expert at legacy software. And so we've been able to develop some methods where we can keep those legacy type softwares going. For example, with the Cyan's, there is no version of software past XP. Right. So if you're using one, it's going to be on some kind of a lockdown XP operating system. And so that's basically what we what we try to do is we try to identify areas where we can lock those operating systems down. IT hates old operating systems. So we have a few techniques where you, you can shell that operating system underneath somebody else so that, you know, there's a firewall between it and IT. So you don't necessarily have the ability to see the internet with it, but you don't want the, you don't want it to see the internet. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so um, legacy software support is definitely the number one way to kill equipment. Now I know a field engineer who works for Millipore over on their water side and the newer Millipore um, RO units actually have a clock cycle set where you get a blue screen after so many clock cycles. Oh my God. What? And you call them up and they tell you, nope, it's worn out. They give you the bio rad speech. It's worn out. You'll have to replace it. And so they send somebody out. They bring you a new one. They take the old <sighs> one back in. They go in and reset the firmware, replace the filters and, you know, sell it out again. Jeez. It's a very tawdry thing. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that device other than the firmware says, I've done my number of cycles and I'm shutting off. Insane. So, yeah, it's insane. Wow, that's, that's beyond the pale. <laughs> that's what we're seeing with uh, the latest round of Diva 9. Diva 9 has a software lockout for service. In it. Mm -hmm. You can no longer get into the service page. And that's uh, just, just the beginning. There making a situation, and, and this is ironic, I want to point out, they're making a situation where their own service people 
have to get authentication from the internet to work on machines that don't have firewalls that they recommend you not hook on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> this is, I, I still have not really been able to connect all of this together. But interestingly enough, we've been able to port firewalls on Windows 10 and Windows 7 to be able to run Diva and still have a firewall. And I really don't know why BD doesn't do that because it doesn't take a genius to do it. You know, anybody with any IT credentials at all can go in and open up a port for Diva and open up a port for the FTP. And now you have a firewall and you can run Diva and you don't have to. You know. So we don't understand a lot of things how they get to where they are. And I don't know if it's just whoever was in charge of that project left and they just considered the project done. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I really don't have yeah. a clue for how, you know, how it ends up in a situation like that where you have one, two, three, four, five generations of software on a cytometer that it is a Windows platform and not one person at the company has said, hey, why don't we just port a hole in the firewall? I mean, you could port this through the firewall. It's not really hard to do. It just requires, you know, you to go in and set the firewall up correctly. Again, I, I'm not sure if they if they ran into a situation of desire or competence. Maybe they just didn't want to do it because it's easier to tell everybody to leave it off. Or maybe they didn't have the people with the with the knowledge, you know, maybe they didn't have field engineers with enough IT knowledge to to, to go into that. Mm -hmm. I don't really know. When I first started with BD at the point where the Canto came in, I would have had to go get knowledge and higher level IT skills because even after working on cytometers for 20 years at that point, I had no IT skills to be able to go in and figure out what's Diva doing, how does the database work? I wouldn't have been able to figure out any of that stuff. And unfortunately, my colleague has all of those skills. So he was able to come in. And now we look at this stuff with almost contempt at the incompetency of their play. <laughs> and I will say that, and they're probably going to be somebody coming back to me about it, but mm -hmm. it's the truth. Um, if you're going to do something, do it. There's no reason to try to pretend like with the Diva 9 software lockout. They made it so that you can't use the BD service Superman password, which is commonly known in the industry. Now you have to have this Google authentication to, you know, so you have to show your cytometer to the internet in order to let your field engineer work on it. <laughs> Do we get that? So now only their field engineers will be allowed to those critical settings that you need to do, depending upon the instrument. If it's an ARIA, it's essential that the operator have access to it because you can't even adjust the brightness on your camera right. yeah. without going into the service settings. So they went to all of this trouble to create this Google authentication but they didn't do a dang thing to lock the database down. And so mm -hmm. you go to the database and create a user and give the user level three access and you log into the service page through that user because they have service access. Well, I need to write this down. <laughs> but, you know, why do you, why do you do this stuff? It took anybody who knew anything about computers especially if they're familiar with how diva and the sql database works it would take them five whole minutes to crack this thing right there's just oh you know i promise that your engineers spent way more time figuring that out than my guy did getting around it <laughs> is there any not, element you know, of that that's based on um like I don't know if liability is the right word, but like, are they worried that some user is going to get in there and change something, get bad data, and then make their instrument look bad? It's it's possible, except where the line is drawn on that, where flow cytometers differ from clinical instruments, even though some flow cytometers are used in a clinical environment, you're not allowed to make a diagnosis off of results that come off of a flow cytometer. Hmm. 
You can proffer a diagnosis. You can support a diagnosis, but you can't make it off of your flow data. You have to put your flow data in conjunction with something else to say this is what it is. Unlike a chemistry analyzer, unlike a hematology analyzer, unlike a coag analyzer, these things are all locked in. And so in those cases, you wouldn't necessarily want just anybody in there dinking around. I'm not suggesting that any user should go into any of those settings and start fiddling with them, not knowing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But we have a very unique environment in flow cytometry because it's for research only. And because we can't do direct reporting on a diagnosis based on the results of a flow cytometer, we don't have that stringent control over who touches it and what they do. One of the ways, like the litmus test for it, is does the instrument have controls or do you make the controls for the instrument? So if an instrument comes with controls, like from STREC, where you have low, medium, and high, and you run that on your chemistry analyzer or you run that on your hematology analyzer, now you have a set of boundaries and ranges that have been set up by someone else. In the flow world, the best thing we have close to that is CAP. The CAP survey sends a sample around and lets people run a, you know, a small selected number of things based on their CAP credentials. And, and that's really about all you get. So having somebody go in and make changes on that is probably not going to create big rifts in your data. It's probably not going to knock your stuff out of the realm. And even if it did, no one's going to die because you made the wrong diagnosis. It's just not going to be consistent with the rest of the information that you have. Okay. So that's, that's the angle that you are in terms of the legal reality. Now, Customers, uh, companies like Beckton Dickinson and Beckman and these companies that also make clinical instruments, they want very much for that clinical realm to, to slide over the top of flow cytometry because then they get to own more of the market share. They mm -hmm. get to own more of the parts. Now, this is something that has become a, a real big mystery for me, especially in the last 10 years with with the fall of SciTech, I don't really see another SciTech coming along because I recognize what it's taken for me and what it takes for me to, to sit here. This is not the realm of, of private little companies who just, you know, come and go at the whim of revenue. If you're going to come and you're going to be in the business I'm in, in this industry, you're going to have to be independently wealthy or stubborn as a freaking mule <laughs> because there's no way in the world you will survive the tide otherwise if mm -hmm. it's just if if your heart's not in it if your passion's not there you're just not going to stay at this because there's yeah. way other things to do that you know would give you a better place and and create more money i don't really see myself after 33 years of being a privateer, I can't really see myself moving out of that theater. I can't imagine why I would want to. Um, you know, it's I have a field. Yeah, I have a, a really good uh, thing going on now. I'm old enough. I've been around so long. I must be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I find it funny that you talk about SciTech. You said the fall of SciTech. Uh, as, but like to us, SciTech is now the, the biggest thing ever. Like Ascendant. It's, it's right. And I just got a yeah. letter from SciTech just recently saying that they're, uh, they're servicing Amnes and Guava now. So SciTech has bought well, they, Amnes they bought the, yeah. and, they, and they bought Guava, which I understood that was happening because Millipore didn't know what in the hell they were doing with either of those things. Mm -hmm. But I have three Amneses down in my barn that are brought in for recycling. So there's your half a million dollar machine that you bought because you're too lazy to make a slide. And there's yeah. three of them sitting in my barn. Ain't one of them got 200 hours of use on them. Those machines are tanks. They never break. And so I just got to get somebody to teach me how to operate them because I got, I have oh, a yeah. surplus. Yeah, call us. We, Bert and I, we know. Yeah. Okay. Love it, Amos. We should trade. 
<laughs> <laughs> I'll trade some of my knowledge for some of yours. <laughs> Another question Absolutely. for you. So, so Bert, when he was in my lab, was the guy who would go in the instruments and try to fix stuff on his own with very often successfully, sometimes not so much. Mm -hmm. um, in your views, what what would you think you come up, like the common users is able to do uh, in in terms of repairing instruments, re like replacing parts? Um, what what's the what's the range of stuff that you think we we we're, we should be able to do, and and where do we we should stop before we hurt ourselves? I'm going to qualify that by instrument line. Yep. Because some instrument lines are open platforms like the LSR2. And I would say there probably is no boundary with the proper training. Other instruments like the ARIAs, you know, there's a little more to those. There's a, f a few more nuances about those. And, you know, having some good inside training would probably help. I, I don't think I would want to turn somebody loose inside of an ARIA without really knowing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. It's not like uh, the vantages and moflows where everything's out in the open and there's lots of fiddle sticks and mm. you know eventually you can figure out what they all do the arias are a lot more subtle everything's encased in that cuvette and you know they're not the first cuvette sorter right the ortho was the first cuvette sorter hmm. i've never seen an ortho oh is that right no there's still there's one analyzer still in existence in south dakota all right and they huh. use it for uh sperm chromatin and, hmm. um Structural assay, SCSA, uh, DNA fragmentation. It runs AO, and it has two parameters, red and green. <laughs> Pat Sims, and, Pat is the uh, operator, is the manager that uh, Bert replaced. She just retired, and and she was talking about her work on the ortho, and and it, all the work was just figuring out how to get side scatter signal. That was like the hardest thing ever. It was huge. Yeah. Now, the the orthocytofluorograph optical bench, someday we can take a picture, bring it out if you really want to go into it. It actually has the ability to pick fluorescence off of forward scatter. We think of oh. it in terms of all of our fluorescence coming off of side scatter. But back in the day, they were pulling fluorescence signals off of forward scatter as well. It, of course, proved to be entirely redundant because the signals that came off side scatter were better and more intense. Mm -hmm. But that just goes to show you what the original optical engineers were up against. They didn't really know. <laughs> and they were throwing stuff at the wall to see what stuck. Right. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's where it ended up. So now, of course, you know, generations and generations have come. When I saw the Aria come out with a cuvette sorter, of course, that was a great chuckle to those of us from the ortho days because we have seen this monster before, and that's mm. the righteously the right way to do it. If you know you can make a really good analyzer and a really good sorter, and you know that's okay. I do remind people though that analyzing cells with a sorter is sort of like driving a trim nail with a pickaxe. It'll do it, yeah, nice one. but there's probably a more elegant tool right. out there to, to do that with. You're, you're most likely putting more resources into that than you need to. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. If you're trying to you know, do that. It costs a lot more money to run an ARIA than it does a Canto or an LSR or, or these kinds of things. So um, I think that to get back, to circle back around to your question, I think that in most of the instruments, the the user's ability to go inside and, and do meaningful work is really based on the training and the procedures that are available to them. I have a, a number of people who I work with who have been long-term customers over two decades that, you know, they don't do well with their lawnmower when it breaks, but they're not afraid to sit down with me in front of a flow cytometer and help and let me walk them through stuff. And that's because they've got enough experience doing that. And they understand that I won't take them someplace they won't, they don't need to be. Mm. That I'm going to make sure, that, you know, because we know each other, I'm going to make sure that I don't take them someplace where their skill level is going to get them lost. I, right. I just, you know, that's not going to happen. 
And so that's really the beneficial thing. And one of the programs that we're trying to get underway right now, that's one of those things that's hard to, um, it's hard to budget the money because, you know, the return on it is so scattered and why, I don't even really know where it's going to come from, but it probably will. And that is to can these procedures. That was kind of why I was quizzing you about, hey, can you see this? Does this look good? Yep. Because I'm looking at setting up a situation where I go through these training procedures and, and we get a good solid video library of these so that they can outlast, you know, they can outlast me essentially. And, but more so, so that other people can have access to them without without me having to be tied up to do it. It's the same training class I've given dozens of times. So I might as well give it to the camera and let the camera give it to everybody else, as opposed to you know having to be there physically each and every time, especially as time goes on. Before COVID, you would have never heard me talk about this at all. I thought before COVID, I was the only one who operated in that biosafety theater. Mm -hmm. because nobody else really cared. I was the one going in and out of labs all over the country, and they're working on who knows what, but for sure they're not telling me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I have built a biosafety concern around not wanting to take stuff out of that lab when I left. And early on in my career, I used to carry my own lab coat, you know, with a company name and monic and all that. I learned real quick that is a dumb thing to do. You, you go in, you use their lab coat, you leave it there for their laundry. Right. Yeah. Don't take that lab coat home. Yeah. <laughs> One of my trips to um, the American Red Cross, the lab manager caught me going out the door. He says, where's your lab coat? Said, it's in my tool bag. He says, give it to me. You can't leave the building with that lab coat. Oh, shoot. That, that was uh, your own lab coat at that time? It was my own lab coat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and so the Red Cross had, you know, they already had their policies and procedures in place, which was good. And <clears throat> so I got my schooling on that day. <laughs> and then I took a couple minutes to think about it. And I went, yeah, you know what? That's a dang good idea. <laughs> yeah. I don't need to be dragging that stuff around with me where I'm going. Yeah. But it started to get me to think about that. I would think about the time that I would lose being sick. It was always related to commercial travel. Mm. Uh -huh. Always related to commercial travel. I was getting sick from bad food. I was getting sick from the bedspread at hotels. I was getting sick from rail cars not being wiped down very well. And, you know, so we made the transition over to traveling privately instead of traveling commercially. So I got an RV and mm. I started to travel around that way travel times are a lot longer you know obviously i can't charge for that but when i'm on site i get to spend more time with the customer i don't have i remember as a field engineer that a, a third of what you were thinking about when you were on site doing a service call was the job the other two thirds were about your trip out of there were you going to make your next flight what was that going to be you know did you find did you get a hotel yet for tonight you know, things like this that, you know, don't really belong in the mindset, but that's part of what happens in that environment. You don't really right. have a choice. You're you're there and you got to play the game the way they do. Um, and so I kind of went forward with that in 2000, actually, long before, you know, oh, right when 9-11 was happening, we were already converting our first vehicle <laughs> over. And, you know, of course, when 9-11 happened, it's like, this is probably timely. When you think about up till that point, I would carry my tool bag on and I would check my clothes because when I got to the account, I need my tools. Mm -hmm. I can get my clothes later. I can go to Walmart and buy some more clothes, but I'm no one, I'm no one without my tools. And so now, you know, of course, 9-11 came and you are not carrying your tools on. That is not allowed. <clears throat> You'll be lucky if they don't come out on the belt scattered from one end to the other. No. You know, we try to use the best tool bags and latch them and make sure that they have all the access to it. But there's 20 grand in that box right? without parts. And, you know, half of the tools, if I had to, you know, I had to make or I got from BD when they were friendly, 
I don't think they would sell me that stuff today. And so I'm really guarded about those tool bags. And that also is one of the reasons why we're so forward about our own inventory and our own tool systems and our own viewing systems, because we recognize that for the longest time, BD has been using a stream viewing microscope on high powered lasers that isn't really the safest device for the user. And they've been putting that on all of their field engineers, training their field engineers how dangerous it is to the point where their engineers are afraid to use it. So that's a really a counterproductive cycle. And we don't really understand how that could really go forward. We also recognize that they're stepping back more and more and more to the realm of BioRad when you call and say, I help me, I got this going on. Oh, it's worn out. You'll have to buy a new one. Right. Right. Up till this point, when you're the king of flow and you own the fax scan, it is ignorant for you to tell people it's worn out. Uh -huh. <laughs> because, you know, it's not. <laughs> yeah. It's 30 some years going and the instruments are still doing exactly what they were designed to do way back on day one. We just have a better computer, right? right. Most yeah. people don't understand that the flow cell in a fax scan is the flow cell in an X20. It's the same part. They didn't change it. They didn't change it for the LSR. They didn't change it for the caliber. It's the same part. It's been there for the long time. And why change it? If it works, why, you know, why fix it? Yeah. For our standpoint, for my point in the business, and also for all of the users out there, is understanding that from the fax scan to the Celesta, there is such a minor range of change that anyone who was trained or had recognizable understanding of either of these boxes could interchange between any of them and almost anything in between. So BD has not been good at changing the wheel. Other companies have completely morphed things over. Um, for example, if you look inside of a Cytoflex, you will see nothing that resembles a Galios or a Cyan. Right. It's a the completely Cytoflex different was, monster. It's a company that was purchased by Coulter, right? Uh, the Cytoflex? Yeah. They're manufactured in China. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if Coulter owns the company or if they're just contracting. Well, just I'm not sure. Okay, but okay, got it. We could say either way. We know for sure they don't own them 100% because they're Chinese, because the Chinese won't have that. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but uh -huh. they're, deeply in, they're deeply invested into it. And we have seen these boxes come on the market before. Accuracy is a perfect example of that box. Um, Accuracy came on the marketplace right about the time I was getting my ReadyCheck QA program all lined out. And we ran our standardized beads on the Accuracy, and we noticed that their low end is kind of bad. <laughs> and of course, you know, that's a common part in the industry now. Mm -hmm. But someone pointed out to me that. If you're doing phenotyping, it really doesn't matter because you can see a negative from a positive, and that's all I really need to do. So right. for phenotyping, having the crappest optical clarity wasn't really a problem. You could still see the positive from the negative, as it was elegantly described to me in my earlier days. Imagine you're in a back in a in a dark room and someone turns a flashlight on with an orange filter. <laughs> There's your event. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, I get it. Now I understand what we're looking for. Okay, we're looking for colored spots in a dark room. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. That's typing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, went on from there. Don't bother trying to do any DNA work with an Accuracy. Don't bother. There's sure. no real reason for it. You don't have the ability to see anything anywhere close to what you would need to do a cell cycle. I suppose there are people who probably do, but if you could look at the electrical signals and look at how the data is processed the way I see it, you really wouldn't want that data to be, if you're doing something as critical as DNA work, mm -hmm. you would want that data to be you know, five times better, five times more. The clarity is what I'm really looking for. 
the accuracy would tend to categorize things as must be because it's not this where where the other instruments would go that's absolutely what i'm looking for right, right. <laughs> and it would abort everything that's not absolutely what it's looking for as opposed to that must be it so i'll use it and remarkably accuracy's put out pretty good data for phenotyping for what they are that's one place where BD is absolutely non-compliant. They bought Acury from Jack Ball and his group thinking that what they told them was accurate, that because they don't have field service, that they don't have to make parts available. But that's, mm -hmm. not, how that, that's not how the law works. The law doesn't say if they make it available to their field engineers, they have to make it to the... The law says if they make a spare part, they have to make it available. Oh, got it. Right. So the fact that BD has a depot repair center that has parts available to the depot repair center means that they have to make parts available to me in my repair center. And that was the subject of an FTC complaint, which I haven't, like I said, I'm pretty independent with my parts bank now. I don't have to go to BD a lot. Mm -hmm. For the longest time, post SciTech, it has been a fight where I have to park a person on the phone every day to constantly recontact BD until they finally relent and send me the part. Then we did the complaint, hadn't really had any issues about it. About the only parts that we've been buying from them for the last year and a half or so are the sit assemblies for the Canto. Right. The little retainer nut that mm -hmm. holds the bow seal on, people tighten that up and bust the threads off yep. and you know, that's a $1,500 boo-boo. So that's the only thing that we had and we've had nothing but hassles. Three weeks ago, we went to buy one and it was delivered the next morning. Nice. So I kind of got the feeling that BD got the message from the lawyers at the FTC because I spent two hours on the telephone with the lawyers at FTC, clearly explaining to them the trouble that I was having. And I did point out to them that I own a domain called Repair, but I can't post it because I don't have access to Accuri parts. Mm. I have a, a, a work center with four workstations that are outfitted to do Accuri work, but I can't populate a technician in there because I don't have a consistent control over the parts. I don't have Accuri parts. The only part I need for Accuri is the flow cell. Everything else I've already managed to make or determine or make better. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just all about that crappy little flow cell that they've got. And, you know, of course, you, you probably know where this is going, right? You know, I'm going to make my own flow cell <laughs> that's probably going to be better. <laughs> And then I'm going to have a, a retrofit kit for anybody who's got an Accuri to turn it into a real flow cytometer. Yeah. <laughs> Until then, I don't really know. We're trying to just work with it. But what I can say is people filing those complaints to the FTC, it really does seem to be having an effect because BD's absolute resistance to us has seemed to have melted back into the woodwork like it has done so many times over the years, over the 30 years, we have seen them come on strong like that a few times only to have it just disappear eight months later. You know, we mm. can buy whatever we want. Nobody really cares. Somebody's puffing their chest out for the manager or something. And then when they're gone, they don't care. Yeah. Sell them whatever they want. But <laughs> What the engineers used to tell me, my friends who were field engineers at BD at the time, what they would tell me was real simple. It's like, if you fix them, I don't have to. <laughs> they were all about having help because you know, they're all overwhelmed with 60 or 70 clients, in some cases, 120 clients. I limit my people to 25 mm -hmm. because I feel that that's the number that where you're just you're just not going to be useful above mm -hmm. that. If you're catering to 25 different clients, you're busy. You know, yeah. you're pretty busy. If you're, clay, if you're catering to 60 clients, you will not see the light of day. You will be Jeez. in a tunnel 
you know, with a train chasing you. <laughs> here, here in the Midwest, I mean, the territory that these people uh, cover is humongous, and they have to travel all the time to go fix. Like, it it would definitely be in their benefit to teach us how to do main like like minor stuff, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well. We have to go back and look at that. You know, part of this discussion was about how service has changed yeah. and how service has changed in the manufacturers areas, at least where BD and, and the other big players are concerned, is their paradigm has changed. And they've gotten away from allowing or wanting people to be self-sufficient to a point where they want people to be dependent. They don't want you to be reliant at all. They want you to be reliant on them. Mm -hmm. And that is a paradigm that they feel will um, circle the wagons on their market share, so to speak. They figure if you're reliant on them, then they can build that bridge between you and then they got you hooked up. Of course, that's folly because new players like Stratodyme are coming on the market with new strategies and better equipment and better processes to put that equipment on the marketplace. When I go and I see what they're doing, their instruments before they ship, they put it on a, like a vibration shaker. And this thing operates for 72 hours while it's getting the bejesus shook out of it. <laughs> it's like, well, no wow. wonder they work. You know I mean? That's QA that I've never seen outside of the semiconductor industry. Right. You know, to, to do, you know, that's like failure analysis testing. That's not really QA testing. That's like, let's see if we can make it break before it leaves the factory. You know, that's the equivalent to tying it to the back of the pickup truck and dragging it around the yard for a while. It's really a brutal beating on a psychometer to put it on a vibrator and just, you know, let it go continuously. Right. Right. Man, all of these parts inside, they all get their harmonics when the vibration hits them. And if it's going to come apart, it's going to come apart like that. So, that's the thing. And then he offers his obsolescence protection, where if you buy it and you keep a service contract on it, you get to decide when you don't want to use it anymore because he's going to keep it running for you. Yeah. If your lasers die, you know, they replace lasers before they die at Stratodyne. That was a big what when I heard that. <laughs> like the engineer came in and was explaining to the account, and he said he noticed that the diode current on their violet laser was starting to climb so we should go ahead and you know because the lead time is so long we should go ahead and order that laser now to make sure that you know we've got it ahead of time so that was an approach that was so far of a departure from any of the other manufacturers that i'd ever seen and so that's the reason why i have continued to try to build my friendship with shervin and my relationship with stratodyme you know because I really admire how they're approaching that. And I appreciate the fact that they see the deficiencies that currently exist and are willing to, you know, put their money where their mouth is for lack of a better term. And is there you know, a sliver of hope that the rest of the field will follow the example? <laughs> I, um, I can only hope that, yeah. um, I, I don't really, I don't really know what's going on. Given how entrenched the large companies are in their current paradigm, something pretty significant is going to have to happen to shake that. But that does give other companies who are willing to do better, who are willing to take it up a notch and work on a higher level, it gives them an opportunity to sit unfettered for a period of time. And so... That reminds me of a, of a story of, of my beginning in this long ago, before Andy Weinberg, or after Andy Weinberg, I had actually went out to a group of individuals called SCORE. It's the Service Corps of Retired Executives. And they help entrepreneurs by looking over their business plan and you know help them to learn how to set their business up to so that it you know, will hopefully prosper and, and survive over the course of the years. Um, I took my business plan and all the information about what I was planning to do with flow cytometry and third-party service. And what they told me was, 
this probably has no hope of surviving. <laughs> right. And the reason why is because we can't find another another individual who's doing this. Mm. Because you realize that you're playing in the realm of corporations. You're going to need the budget of a small country in order to pull this off. As discouraging as that sounds, what they told me was, I don't have any competition. Right. <laughs> Which is kind of nice. So, yeah. <laughs> so I was dumbfounded when SciTech showed up. You know, I already knew Eric Chase was building add-on things for them. And I had no idea that he had an eyeball on service. And it wasn't until BD told him, we're not going to support any instruments that you modify, that he actually reached out to Ray to try to develop some kind of a service organization. Mm. At that time, he had forgotten completely that I existed. And I've, you know, I've always been under the radar. So, you know, he probably would have been working with them had, you know, a different turn of events happened. Right. Um, I don't know if, it, you know, I would have stepped out before it got to where it is now, but because unlike the situation that Ray created, Ray had a plan and he executed that plan and he did a pretty decent job about it. Kudos to him. As bad as it hurt over here, uh, I have great respect for him and how he how he executed that. I don't appreciate what it did to the industry. It left a, it left a vacuum. Mm. that is not that you can't fill there's no way i can really step into that vacuum and if i try to get too deep in and it's like a wind tunnel i'm going to get sucked in and i've got nothing but venturi action to help me out the other end that's not that usually ends up in splat <laughs> in case you don't know what that means <laughs> it's it it would be counterintuitive to my goal. And my goal is to try to help the little people, to try to help the people who are not overfunded, who don't have budgets to dump, who need everything they can get. The thought of a $6,000 service call puts them on their knees. Mm -hmm. You know, those are my clients. That's the people I work for. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I recognize those other folks are out there and I don't really see the value in creating an institutional environment that caters to that group. My group of people are the 20% of clients that are underserved by the manufacturers for whatever the reason. That's the clients that got me started and I've been all over the board in 30 years and that's the clients that I wanna stay focused to the ones that I want to stay with because it fits more my personality and my feelings about how it should go down the road. Um, if I was looking to do what Ray did, I could have done that a long time ago. I could have expanded and just completely owned third party service in flow cytometry. But what I wouldn't own is my life. Mm. I wouldn't have my life. So like we see so much um, when I go down south, when I do service calls in San Diego, when the surf's in, the lab's empty, right? Yeah. Surf's <laughs> up, lab's empty, boom. Just happens every time. Well, here, when the skiing's good, I'm gone. <laughs> I'm gone. I'll see you when the skiing's not good anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and I could never do that as a corporate employee. You know, I would be forced to be on this regimented schedule, and I really wouldn't have the ability to – be flexible and to respond to what we're doing. And, yeah. You know, well, that's a good life. It's a, it lets me take control of that. And as a field engineer, I did not have control of that. Your field engineers that come to visit you, they do not have control of their schedules and their lives. They're puppets to their managers. If they don't do it the way their manager does it, their manager trumps them and forces them to do it anyway. It is a miserable existence. And, you know, I had a tough time because of the huge geography that I would have. And I would have situations where, you know, my manager would try to push me onto the next call when I'm clearly not done here. And 
you know, this is going to have to be the way it is. And it's like, you know, well, I need you in Anchorage four o'clock tomorrow. It's like, there is no plane that's going to take me to Anchorage by four o'clock yeah. tomorrow. Do you realize that? You, you have any idea what it is that you're asking? And and there was so there were all kinds of things like this. They would sit down in San Jose in the dispatch room, and they would look and they say, "Well, I'm looking at the map. It doesn't look like it's that far away." <laughs> it's that far. So just get your car and drive from Bozeman, Montana, to Great Falls, Montana. The first thing you realize it's it's not that far away, but you're going through the mountains, right. <laughs> the entire way. <laughs> so it's a good solid four and a half, five hours, even though it's 160 miles away. You're yeah. only going to go 35 miles an hour, maybe. And then the weather. Um, one story about a little pushback. This is a funny story. I love this. This is like the highlight story of of. When I was a field engineer, I was in Pocatello, Idaho, doing uh, service calls for BD, and my manager was pushing me hard to get over to Redding, California, to do a service call at the hospital there. They were down, and I was weathered in in Pocatello. So they had canceled all of the flights. There's no airplanes leaving out of there, and so I'm waiting around at the airport, and um they're pushing me pretty hard. Well, can't you just rent a car and go? It's like the freeways are closed. I'm stuck here. Don't you don't don't, don't you get that? <clears throat> and I said, well, look, let me go out, shake some trees. Let me see what I can find, and I'll give you a call back in an hour. And you know, we'll see what happens. Maybe the fog will clear up. Maybe the weather will open up a little bit, and we can get a window out of here. And so, you know, there was nothing going on. I just went back to the rental car and got my rental car back because I know I'm not going anywhere for the night. I know what the weather's like. I grew up in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I called my manager back on the phone and uh, yeah, I told him, I said, it it looks kind of bleak, but I've got a plan. And right at that time, right when I said that, I see this Coast Guard helicopter dropping in. <laughs> and so I told him, Alan, I got to go. My chopper just landed. And I hung up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> the next morning when I called in, he's like, Tony, please, please tell me you did not charter a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, Alan, I did not charter a helicopter, but you have to understand something. I am mission driven. And if you push me, I will succeed. And you're going to pay the bill. Yeah. So you be careful how you do that. You have solid class A material on the other end of this telephone. I do not fail. If you do not want me to do that, you have to back off <laughs> because I will succeed. I will find a way to make this happen. <laughs> That's awesome. And so that was a classic story. And, you know, from that point on, he was a lot more careful about, you know, you know, he knows I know how to get around and I'll make it as fast as I can. <laughs> so, Wow. But that's a funny story. Yeah. I always wondered, you know, what it is about why field engineers don't have airplanes. It should be like issued with your toolbox. Yeah. <laughs> At least a jetpack. <laughs> so, so listen, I want to be mindful of your time. You've been super generous so far. Um, okay. Do you have any uh, final thoughts, any topic we haven't covered that you'd like to... Uh, like a word of wisdom, so to speak. A word of wisdom. For us youngsters. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> the, the word of wisdom I can get here is, is pretty simple. It, it, when it comes to how to deal with manufacturers in the future, vote with your wallet. Mm. Right? Put your money where the people who are willing to support you goes. Don't go after the company just because they're the company. There is no company that's so big that you just got to have a BD instrument or you just got to have a MoFlow. Those people, those companies are all diverse out now and they don't really exist like that anymore. The playing mm. field is much more level than it used to be. When I got hired as a field engineer, I was told that of the questions that a buyer asks, 
The first question that a buyer asks a salesman is, how much does it cost? The second question the buyer asks the salesman is, who's going to fix it? In today's world, question number two back then doesn't even get asked mm. today. And that's what I would suggest that everybody do is put that who's going to fix it back up to question number two, because these assets are hugely expensive, even when you have an institutional budget. If it is an NIH budget, it's the taxpayers' money that we're spending. Collectively, this is all coming out of all our pockets. So we're only doing ourselves a favor, considering that the technology behind flow cytometers has not changed since 1968. We have better computers, but the detection methodology is still exactly the same as it always was. So there's no reason in the world why a 23-year-old flow cytometer should be anywhere close to obsolete when a 35-year-old flow cytometer isn't obsolete yet. Sure. Right, so that's where we go backwards. I mean, it's only obsolete because the manufacturer doesn't want to support it. We've taken that part out of the equation and we've been able to lend ourselves to owners who don't have the money to replace the asset to upgrade the asset and carry the asset forward for another decade and you know stuff like that. We started doing that with our diode laser replacements for the fax scans and have you know just carried that on forward and forward and forward at every opportunity that we've had to to do that. We're more than willing to convert whatever they're using over to the ones we know are super reliable. Yeah. And I, I guess that's the big difference for being an independent, you know, is that I don't have to rely on my purchase, my purchasing manager's decisions. Mm -hmm. you know, I get to go out and actually shake the trees, if you will, and see what falls. And, you know, I can pick the apple up and have a look at it and go try it out. It's not forced to me. Here's your bucket of apples. Go use these. <laughs> right. So that's really the deal. I mean, as consumers, we have to be less willing to accept what the manufacturer says is truth and more willing to be skeptical and to call them when they make these claims about this or that or the other thing is to call them out on it and say, well, you know, here's how this works in the marketplace. I don't want to spend my money on an asset that I don't have the keys for. If you're going to sell me a $285,000 sell sorter, you better damn well sell me the keys to go in and change settings if I need to, or to turn the brightness on my camera up and down. Right. It doesn't make sense to lock me out and put me in an environment, you know, where dumb is dumber. <laughs> does that make sense? Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it does. Kind of, Absolutely. That's kind of a, a thing where, um, as a consumer, I would not want to be marginalized, but at the same point, I recognize what we spoke about before, where you have the magic juice, magic box, and you have that other side of the marketplace that doesn't have highly trained operators, that doesn't, they're not invested in biology, they're invested in the test results that come off of the cytometer, because that's what they ship their product off of. So the cytometer has taken a secondary role in the production environment. And, and not that it shouldn't. I'm not saying it doesn't belong there. Don't get me wrong. It does. But that's where we see this big split, in my opinion, in the marketplace. And that's where we see the huge dichotomy in users, where we have one group of users that come from the temp agency, and we have one group of users that come from, you know, they're on their way to get a PhD or an MD. And so there's a huge, it's like, you right. know, to me, it, there's, a, there's a very significant difference between these two marketplaces. When it comes to training the operators, there is a huge difference. My 45-minute training class that belongs in the lab, it's about 15 minutes over on the other side. Because there's just, you know, when I open the door and I point out to the flow cell and I look in there and they're lost. They don't even know. They don't care. They want to, a flow what? Right. How do you say that? <laughs> that you know, it's just so there's no real reason to do it. Right. Fair. And that's 
And that's a key part of my training classes. Whenever I'm with an operator, if if I'm delivering an instrument, if I'm going there to help them with an instrument that they bought, if I've never met them before, if they've got a new operator, I'll sit down and take 30 to 45 minutes with that operator and point and shoot. I'll point at everything on that and I'll tell them what it is, try to explain how it does. So in the future, when I'm talking with them, they've got at least a basic vocabulary about the things that you know we need to interact on. I find that's just so important, yeah. you know, because it takes the magic out of it. You know, they're not afraid to lift the lid and look at that, you know. Just simply looking at a laser beam isn't going to harm you. But people don't know that. And if you go to the laser safety people, they're going to tell you, oh, yeah, any, any radiation is terrible. And it's horrible. I had a radiation license in the state of Texas. Texas requires anyone working on over 100 milliwatt laser to have a radiation license. Oh, wow. Oh. Like, you know, an x-ray machine kind of a radiation license. When it came time for renewal, I sent them down a data sheet from a pack of 20 laser pointers that were on the shelf in a hardware store. I took my laser power meter in there and I measured all of them. Of the pack of 20, there were only seven of them that were under that were five milliwatts or less. Oh wow. So yeah. 13 of them were completely out of compliance. So 13 of those lasers legally needed to have a radiation license to be sold in the state of Texas. They sent me back a letter saying that I did not need to renew my, my radiation license <laughs> to That's continue working kind. in the state of Texas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it became fairly apparent to them that they're not really enforcing this law. Don't have a handle on it. Yeah. <laughs> right. But that just goes to show you. I mean, uh, you know, I didn't really recognize that until I, um, when green lasers started to get um, popular. Mm. I bought a, a 532 nanometer laser pointer and got it out of the box, put new batteries in it, hit the wall, and went, oh, my, that's about 40 milliwatts. <laughs> and then I put it on my laser power meter, and it was 41.2 milliwatts. Jeez. Man. I was completely blown away that I was able to look at it at the wall from 20 feet away and say, that's 40 milliwatts. <laughs> like, okay, well, you know, yeah, don't stick your eye in that laser beam. Yeah, really. For sure. Yeah. And that's where we're at. We have a lot of stuff. We just recently went over a whole bunch of um, things about these instruments that we know are going to be on the horizon for us. We know that certain component failures are going to start happening. Mm -hmm. We've seen that in the lifespan of the scan, the lifespan of the caliber, the lifespan of the LSR2, where... At a certain age, we'll have a, a cycle of things that start to fail. And the very first time we noticed it was way back in California during the brownouts. And we had, in the period of about eight months, we had 12 laser power supplies die. And so we started to see the cycle. And then six years went by before we saw another one <laughs> die <laughs> and then we would go into things where we would have the dcm pump would fail and then over the period of the next year we'd have five or six dcm pumps fail and we never saw one fail for two years or three years either side right. of that and so we learned that there are manufacturing cycles when they went they ordered a thousand of these units at once and at that point in time, all the units that were manufactured about that time were starting to wear out. Sure. And so it creates this replacement cycle where you have instruments, you know, literally all over the country. But then in retrospect, we went back and we looked at those and these instruments were all over the country, but they were within 100 serial numbers of each other. Oh, right. So they were all produced at the same point in time yeah. on the manufacturing line, and they were all part of that parts inventory that came out. And so, you know, we're able to see that kind of stuff. And because we keep track of it, you know, we sort of watch for that coming around. And we like to, you know, understand what's going on that. We've also learned there are some things that are just not to be. And that's um, reliable red laser diodes. <laughs> there are companies that make better ones. Vortran makes the best. 
But nobody's going to make you a red diode that's going to last as long as that Heaney did. Right. And, and that's, that's just the way it is. Um, right. We see it over and over and over again. I've got Heaney's in here that are 15, 18 years old that are still pushing full power. And I've got coherent cubes that are, you know, a couple hundred hours on them and they're dead already. Some of them with thousands, a few thousand hours. On them. Yeah. Um, Fortran's a good company. Um, they're the first people that confirmed to me formally and realistically that diode lasers can be repaired. That that, that was oh, an really? absolute, oh. Oh. That, you know, they were absolutely firm with me about that when I asked them if, you know, can they repair them? And the answer was yes, they can. But they don't repair anybody else's. They don't want to because they're not their inferior manufacturing. Sure. So they don't want to put their name on somebody else's junk. And I get that. Um, so they were kind enough to share with me, though, some of the nuances about what the other manufacturers of lasers were doing wrong. <laughs> and that helps me because that lets me do those repairs. Right. Um, but once again, I hold those repairs up against this company that makes the best. And I have to question, why am I doing this repair? I should just be working with the company that does the best. And then I don't have to do the repair. Mm -hmm. I'm happy. Customer's happy. If it ever breaks, we send it back to company and let them do it and let them do it right. Mm -hmm. And so far, this is, I'm trying to think when I sold my first conversion laser. I put my first conversion laser in an LSR2 in 2010. And I just took that LSR2 in for recycling. That laser's got 6,400 hours on it and it still works perfectly wow. without a, not a thing on it. So it lived a whole lifespan in that client's account and you know could just as easily be taken out and put in another one down the line. Um, I tell my clients that when you're buying that laser for a conversion on the fax caliber, this is the last laser you'll ever buy. And I can say that with surety because Steve at Vortran assures me that if one of those lasers dies, I can send it in, he will repair it and send it back to me. And there's a fixed cost for that. And it's a fraction of the cost of the laser new. Right. So, <clears throat> These are companies that are willing to go to the next level. They're willing to step up and put their money where their mouth is. And I think that's what, as consumers, we have to start identifying those companies and talking about those companies, trying to give people like Shervin, you know, some time. I'm pretty comfortable if you wanted to bring Shervin on your podcast and have him talk about Stratodyme and oh, their yeah. cytometers, I'm sure he would be happy to do that. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Okay, cool. That, that's again been sometime. awesome. And we have uh, lots is of there, topics. Is, <laughs> is there a way uh, people can reach out to you if they want to talk and learn more? And do you have a? Our website is in limbo right now because okay. of the visibility from BD. We're hoping to get that back up and going. Mm -hmm. um, we actually, as I pointed out, we have the Accuracy dot repair URL that we're wanting to bring up. We also have a new one that um, is going to go forward with our with our subscription program called cytometer.repair. Okay. And that's going to be where we're going to have our subscription programs set up for the different instruments. And that'll be where those users will interface um, from there. Other than that, you can email me at faxhelp at altservice.com. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me. All right. Sounds where good. Where I live, the phone... Phone support is good. I'm in the building, so Wi-Fi is keeping us connected. But uh, if <laughs> I go <pretty> out, <laughs> it gets pretty spotty pretty quick up here. Okay. We're um, 20 miles off I-5. Oh, so yeah. I live about, I don't know, uh, in the foothills, about six or 700 feet in elevation. So it's pretty low land where I'm at. We're just starting into the forest here. And then um, by the time you get up to the pass, the pass here is only well, the roads at 
just under 5,000 feet. So it's not even as high as the elevation in the Midwest. Yeah. <laughs> but there's like nine feet of snow right now <laughs> up there. <Jeez. laughs> it's amazing the amount of snowfall that they get here in the Cascades every year. We, uh, we really enjoy it. I got pictures of us snowmobiling on the 28th of April. Man. Feels like home. I'm from Quebec City, and then we we do have snow oh. pretty late in the. Yeah. Yes, yes. I grew up in the northern plains uh, in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Up Ooh, in the northern plains of the Black, above the Black Hills. So I'm used to long, cold winters. Yes, they're the best. <laughs> I understand what you know. All four seasons can be like. Yes. <laughs> Here, the four seasons, they just, there's like a smear into each other. It's, yeah. it's kind of hard to tell when one changes and the other one doesn't. The leaves tell you when autumn's coming and, you know, occasionally some snow will fall. Uh, springtime is probably the shortest season here. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The last few years, it's been lasting about five days. <laughs> <laughs> we By go the time from, you know it's there, it's gone. Yeah, we go from cool, moist weather right into heat. It's like, uh, yeah, uh, time to go to the lake, get the boat out. All right. right, Tony. Well, it's been our pleasure. It was so much fun talking to you. Thank you. And, Likewise. Uh, thank you for our, our, our listeners for uh, tuning in and we'll talk to you later.